Hi, my name is Lucas, lead developer of Wild Mage, and this is the Rated R Show. Hello guys and welcome back. Yes, welcome back to another glorious episode, 113 if I'm not mistaken. Yes guys, joining me is Drek. He's got a few games he wants to talk to you about today. My name as always is Bam Havoc. Uh, you might want to stick around because Drek and G talk to Lucas about Wild Mage. Yes, interesting conversation that is. So guys, let's kick this one off and talk to Drek. Drek, what games do you want to discuss with us today? Holy freaking brown cow, is that Bam Havoc I hear? <laughs> the one, the only, the Bam of Havoc, yes, yes. I have returned from my, my oh, I want to say holiday, but it really wasn't. Illness and uh, much, much illness. But, 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 I have returned. You can't keep a good Bam down. The prodigal Bam returns. <laughs> <laughs> prodigal, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, yes, well, this is our uh, upcoming game segment, so I guess we will jump right into it with the games that are going to be releasing in May. So first up, we have Conan Exiles, which I know has been out in early access for a while, but they're now going to be releasing in full on the 8th of May on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Uh, it's an action-adventure survival game. Bam, have you looked at this at all? Believe it or not, I have seen the game. I haven't played it because I'm not a PC Master Razor. I have watched uh, PewDiePie play it. I've watched uh, Jack Frags play it. I think Jack Frags played it. I've watched a lot of people play it, and it, it looks cool. It looks really cool. I got to say, I, I love the fact that when you're running your own server, you can turn down a lot of the survival stuff because I'm just not a huge fan of keeping track of whether or not my character is getting too cold or if he needs food or water or stuff. It's it's too many little tickers for me. It, it kind of ruins the experience. So I love more the exploration and the combat aspects of it. And um, yeah, it's it's been fun. And, and the base building and crafting stuff in it was also quite a bit fun. Uh, me and a couple of buddies of mine, we, we're going to be Looking forward to setting up our own little server here in the near future to, to get back into it again. Dude, when the zombies come, trust me, you're going to be worried about you being hungry, you being cold, you being thirsty. Those tickers, man, they're training you, brah. They're training you. <laughs> oh, training for the real life zombie apocalypse. Okay, gotcha. Well, if if you are to believe world popularity, Atlanta is the center of all zombiness. So, you know, Jolly's been gone for a good couple of months. That's what's happened, you see. Atlanta's become zombie central. Well, I was going to try and figure out how to segue that into the uh, Destiny 2 expansion Warmind that comes out on the same day, but I don't know. I was thinking something about zombies playing Destiny because it's just um, a, a lot of a lot of rehashing of the same thing. I, you know, you're not wrong. You're my not, excitement not wrong. for Destiny 2. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my excitement for Destiny 2 was somewhat tempered by the fact that it looked like it was a. Uh, oh, how how best to put this? I've I've, I've even heard this uh, copy paste of Destiny One. Um, I, th yeah, there needs to be a lot more content, and so hopefully the Warmind DLC that comes out on the 8th of May uh, for all platforms, PC, PS4, and Xbox One, should hopefully... I, I hope it's better than Osiris, because Osiris was such a small content add-on, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, as I was just talking in the background there, uh, nope, nope, and correct. Small content, rehashed, replastered, you're paying money, good money, to play the same map, map, to play the same map backwards. It happened with Destiny One. It happened with Destiny Two. Bungie have figured out a model. They figured out that they can take their fan base and quite literally not just take some of the money, all of the money, not just little bits, lots of it. They just want all of the monies, you know. So that's Bungie's marketing plan. If they had a truly inspired game, that. For example, that Halo was when it first came out, and Halo Reach, that was a brilliant game, Halo Reach. Um, and But Destiny 1 could have been. I reckon they'd have a much firmer base, and they'd have a lot more money in their back pockets right now if they just followed through with their grand plans. But, you know, that's just me talking shit from a crusty old Destiny 1 player that did spend all the monies and realized you really shouldn't have. <laughs> well, because I was so excited it was coming out on PC and I was going to get to play Destiny on my computer, I went with the Season Pass. So I think at least with Warmind, I'm still covered. So I should get that for free, I think, if I remember right. You you will, you will. But let me tell you, you'll be absolutely biting your teeth, gritting. And, I paid 50 extra dollars just to play this map backwards. 
<laughs> well, in, in this case with Warmind, they said we're supposed to be going to Mars. And it looked like from the uh, teaser trailer that they put out that we're going to be playing in, in some kind of icy area. So I guess we'll get to see on the 8th of May when it finally comes out. So so Mars, um, been there, done that. Even the little... Um asteroidal moon that floats around uh, Mars itself. Been there, done that. This is Destiny 1, mind you. So instead of running around a brown surface, you're going to run around a white surface. Yeah! <laughs> Alright, well we're just going to cut right to the end of May. I know there's a ton of games coming out next month, but of course we can't cover them all, as always, so we're just highlighting a few that have captured uh, our interest. And next up is another DLC for another popular MMO. This will be the Elder Scrolls Somerset DLC, an adventure fantasy, massive multi-online fantasy, all, all the acronyms. Um, this will be on the 21st for PC and then on June 5th for PS4 and Xbox One. Never really got into the um, Elder Scrolls Online. Um, I, I love the, the games, you know, um, Skyrim and so on. I love them games. Very absorbing games you just want to carry on playing even though you're dead tired and haven't slept two days and you haven't eaten in like at least five um but uh, all i know about the game is even plays it and that's all i need to know about it so there we go that that's it's essentially it I, I, it's it's a game that does not interest me in the slightest when it comes to that it's a game that i played for uh, i want to say pretty heavily for probably about the first nine months that it, it had come out and I've gone back to it a couple times. There's still some earlier DLC stuff that I have that I have not finished through. Um, I think I'm a good part into the Thieves Guild. I don't remember if I've even started the Assassin's Guild, and I'm at the tail end of Orsinium. So I still never even got into the last DLC yet that they had with Morrowind. But the world that they've created there is unbelievably amazing. It's The game is, is a lot of fun to play. But the, the problem I've run into... And it's a great problem to have with an MMO, but the problem I ran into with Elder Scrolls, I think, was content exhaustion. Whereas with most MMOs, you're running around doing the same thing over and over and over again. And you can make the argument with Elder Scrolls that the type of tasks you're doing are the same kind of thing. But there's just so much to do with Elder Scrolls that after a while, it's just like, oh my God, even more. <laughs> so at oh, some yeah, point, agreed. I will get back to it. Yeah, at some point, I'm going to get back to it. But it's not going to be on the twenty first. <laughs> don't don't misread or don't mis misread mishear what I said. I'm not saying that it's a bad game. I'm just saying that game doesn't interest me because I prefer to play you know the uh, the old fashioned way of playing. You know, the, the playing that isn't the online bit. But you're right. There is so much content that you don't sleep for three days, don't eat for five, and you haven't got a, had a drink of water at least two. You know, you're dehydrated, you're knackered, and you're tired because you just want to carry on playing because there is so much to do in the little CD world, you know, the little DVD world they've uh, sold you. There's just so much to do, and I didn't for one second feel, think that uh, that wasn't the case in the online bit because, you know, it's Elder Scrolls Online. It's Bethesda. <laughs> yeah. Well, and one of the reasons I probably won't be getting into Somerset that early is because the day after it comes out on the 22nd of May for PC and Xbox One, State of Decay 2. And that is another one that I'm looking forward to. It's it's one that I'll be playing cooperatively and, and whatnot uh, at our LAN sessions. Uh, this is a, you know, zombie apocalypse type thing, third person shooter, co-op survival game. And I know I just got done when we were talking about Conan saying I wasn't that into survival stuff. And I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the any mechanics there are with regards to food or you know, clothing or, you know, whatever is, 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 I'm hoping that there's not a lot to that. I haven't seen much with the videos that I've watched so far, though. Anything about survival games, it's all about the survival element. It's about those tickers. It's all about them tickers that you despise of. But I do have a question for you. Who is the publisher for this uh, zombie survival game you're talking about? Uh, if, unless I'm mis misreading as i recall it was being published by microsoft and i think this is going to be another one of their titles where don't quote me for accuracy but i believe it may be another one of those things where it's cross by so that if you have it on xbox one or windows 10 you can play it on either one um i know that they said they were going to be doing that with a lot of games but i know they're not necessarily doing that with every game 
I'm not particularly worried about that, though, because I don't have an Xbox One, so I'll just be playing it on PC. Okay. I have always been a bit dubious about Microsoft as a publisher in the video game world because, you know, Microsoft, they have no taste, you know, to quote to quote a famous individual. They have no flair, you know, so... I, I do hope this game does well because that'll go ahead and prove me wrong. You know, I'm always a bit skeptical about certain things and particularly video games because I am now a salty, salty individual because I've been burned so many times by publishers. You know, I, mm, yeah, I'm a bit worried about that, but never mind. I do hope this game turns out to be as good as it sounds. I do enjoy the zombie survivals. It's They're good. They're good. I guess if they were the ones making the game, you might have to worry a little more about their taste. But since this is being made by Undead Labs and, you know, they have State of Decay 1 under their belt. And from what I understand, it was pretty popular. I think uh, you probably don't have to worry about their taste so much. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, the only way I've seen to get this so far is you do have to buy it through Microsoft's online market. This isn't going to be something that will be available, you know, through Steam. But, uh I don't know. It looks like it's going to be fun to play. So I, I guess you'll have to ask me um, a few days after the, the 22nd to see how I feel about that. <laughs> and I will do. Well, all right. And that brings us to our last game of the of the lineup here for this, this particular month. Um, I wanted to make sure I included something on here for you uh, PS4 guys in the group here. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. Oh. <laughs> I know what you were thinking I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know what? It, it, if I were to use that particular term, I would fall into that category as well, considering that I have both a PS4 and a Switch anyway. D- don't sully this podcast with using that N-word, please. Let, let, let's not, let's not um, sully this beautiful, glorious podcast using those, those, that, that sort of vile language, please. <laughs> well, if you consider that to be vile language... <laughs> You must not have listened to the interview yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I didn't I even bring it up. No, the developer I brings it I up for me. I, I haven't pre listened to a really episode that hasn't been released. And, I'm, you know, you know my feelings about, y- you know, that, that, that company. So, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even have to bring it up. The developer brought it up for me. So, there. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to listen to this week's um, interview with. with uh, with bated breath and a keen ear, yes. Yeah, well, before we, we go to break and turn it over, the last game lineup was Detroit Become Human. It's an action-adventure game for the PS4. It looked, it looked like, I think, it's a PS4 exclusive. Is it really a PS4 exclusive? That sounds I think so, because I've only seen that listed on PlayStation. I haven't seen it listed for sale in other places yet, but maybe well, I missed it. Well, believe it or not, I've been out the works now for, what was it, like five weeks, four, four five weeks, and I do not know... A thing. There's been so many goings on around the internet that we briefly discussed before this this little um, video game thing that I don't want to bring it up now. But it's almost like the whole world's changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I don't always look at console stuff too closely because I get so little time to actually play on console. I I really want to sit down and play God of War. I'm I'm forcing myself, or I should say, I'm I'm not allowing myself to buy God of War until I finish Horizon Zero Dawn, which I still haven't gotten back to finish yet. Horizon Zero Dawn is a good game. Oh hell yeah, it's a lot, lot of fun to play. I just finish time has that been game. The problem. Finish that game. It's a good game. So on that note, I guess we should uh, turn it over here to the interview, and uh, G and I will be back after the break to talk to Lucas about Wild Mage Phantom Twilight. And from me, guys, thank you very much for sticking around so long. There's a very interesting interview coming up that I apparently need to listen to, so I'm going to stick around and listen to it as well. Uh, Cheerio, chaps. Hi, my name is Lucas, lead developer of Wild Mage The Phantom Twilight. Our Kickstarter is live right now. Check it out. And This is the Rated R Show. Hola. Hey, folks. We're back from the break, and with me, I have Genius. Hey everybody, yeah, it's one of those interviewee thingies again, so we have a guest, and I'm looking at my paper, I'm slightly confused, because according to my note, we're interviewing about a role-playing game, but Drac, you, and Lucas, our guest, are both from SoCal. I thought there were only cool people down there, what are you doing playing role-playing games? All the cool people play role-playing games. <laughs> uh, okay, anyways, yeah, hi Lucas, welcome 
I understand that right now, literally, as people listening to this, you have a Kickstarter going out. Uh, yes, we do. We've got a Kickstarter for a game called Wild Mage Phantom Twilight. It's a uh, online action RPG. Um, it's more in the style of like a Diablo 3 multiplayer where you only have four or five people on one game at one time. So Diablo style, so it's a little bit of hack and slashy? Yeah, hack and slash, but it's still more more story than... I mean, Diablo had story, but... <laughs> it did? I never noticed. It's more like a you know, 3D world element. You can go explore. The world's based on floating islands, airships, kind of steampunk, match tech style, dungeons. It's made or kind of focusing towards people like me who... Uh, I grew up playing MMOs and... I just don't have time for them anymore. You know, I don't have eight, six or eight hours to do a raid or to catch up on gear or anything. So I have like I have like one or two hours. So there's not a lot of games that people like me can play anymore with my friends and family like we used to. And those were always like some of the best times we had. So I want to make a game that would cater to people like me who could get in for an hour or two, still run a dungeon or do something substantial and um and have fun with your friends and from every you know because i have friends from all over the u.s or all over the world that you still want to play with um get in do something and but still be able to get out and not be stuck there for three or four hours or you know you fall behind in levels and you know you can't get your group together things like that that actually sounds pretty cool because that is for me as well the headache these days i don't want to dedicate six eight hours to a raid yeah, you know, it really is. And or, you know, someone's working and then they you fall behind like um, like they're level 30, but they can't do your level 50 dungeon because you've had a couple days off. So now you're out of whack. So the to synchronize with your actual group and to be able to get in and play with with your friends is, you know, I only need five or six people that we play with that can cycle out. Maybe someone can't make it one day. Other person can't make it the other day, but you can still get in and, and have fun. And I miss that, you know, like now it's just work and home and we don't have time for, you know, that kind of time for the MMOs anymore. Adulting sucks. <laughs> it sure does. Yeah, why were we in such a hurry to be adults as a kid? <laughs> I can't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> nah, live in the dream. That's right. So you, you mentioned MMOs as being part of the inspiration for something like this. And I know in a lot of MMOs, you'll find that there's like a PvP mode. I don't typically spend too much time in that because I find more enjoyment playing, you know, cooperatively with friends. And I noticed on Steam, it's mentioned multiplayer and co-op. Is there a PvP mode for folks who might be interested in that, or is this specifically to play with your friends? It's it's there's no PvP yet. Um, I would love to implement PvP because I, I dominate in PvP, but <laughs> um, I I don't have it. Uh, hopefully, the game can evolve after we release, and I I hope to because. The way I have it structured is that we'll keep releasing islands every month or so, so there'll always be continual content being created for the game, so you'll always have new stuff. The scope is smaller than most games. I'm not gonna you're not gonna come into a world the size of, you know, um, WoW or, you know, EverQuest or something. The scope's a lot smaller, it's a smaller team. But the way that it's structured, we have floating islands everywhere. Going to create one island, which I'll have like a town, a dungeon, um, treasure hunting, which is kind of like a non-combat. A non-combat, it's more traps, it's more puzzles. Um, you know, you can you can go around, harvest, mine, all that stuff when no one's around. You can still get uh, lore books, you can still get spells and stuff, but in a non-combat environment. Will the environments, like, say, once you've cleared a dungeon, does it stay clear, or can you go back and do it again? Do things respawn? Oh, things respawn. And so so everything's floating above this miasma, right? Which the miasma is pretty much, like, pure mana, right? And this that's the miasma is what spawns all the monsters. So w the, the islands are floating above it, and they're floating at different altitudes, right? So they all are kept in the air by these float stones, which just, they keep the island up. So at night, the miasma comes up, um, and then the day the sun beats it down, it goes back down. So if you get stuck in a dungeon at night, it's going to be 
a lot more difficult than it is in the daytime. Um, but that's how everything respawns is the day-night cycles. Ah, okay. I've heard you say a couple times, we. How many people make up the team? Um, well, it's a small team. So it's me. Um, I have uh, my brother is going to be doing the um, Rick McCann. He's doing. He's going to do the concept art um, and all the 2D splash screens, you know, for loading. He uh, he has worked at DreamWorks for a long time. Uh, was the animation guy there? He taught everyone animation. So like, um, uh, I can't f- remember, but a, a bunch of movies he's on. Um, and then I have a couple composers. A good friend of mine, John Ravencroft, has done the music for a lot of the trailers you heard. And then another composer, um, Fabio Amuri, uh, really talented. Um, so we're hoping to have a really great soundtrack because I, I believe that music is um, very important for games. Um, every every game that I remember always had a, a huge soundtrack. You know, you have Final Fantasy, you have um, Elder Scrolls. I mean, music plays a huge part in it. So I want to try and bring um, as big of a scale of music that we can bring. Um, of course, that's why we're asking for money because, you know... Those are one of the things that you often see in Kickstarters, where they say, well, we don't really need money to do the programming, we'll do that ourselves. But a lot of the artworks, and that includes music, yeah, comes from really talented people outside, and it has to, because it sets the setting, it sets quite a tone in these games. And therefore, you need to splurge a little bit on it. Yeah, it sets a huge tone, and it's, it's very important for me, especially in a world like this. Um, this is the kind of world that I've wanted to create for a long time. Um... You know, you see it in Final Fantasy, you have the float. I mean, the concepts aren't new. You have floaty islands, you have airships, you have all this stuff. Like, you see them in Final Fantasy, you see them in other games, but you only kind of see, like, a glimpse. I don't ever feel like anyone ever really expanded on it. You were never living in that world, you know? You never you never went to a skyport, you know, and you flew your airship around, landed in some remote island, and crawled into some ruins to find who knows what. You know, that that game has never existed, so I really want to bring that to the table. Well, I could reference some old gold box games from, ooh, 91, 92, that sort of had it, but you didn't really see them as floating things. It was just a floating city. It was just a setting. There was no interaction with it. There was no getting there. Right. I mean, there's there's plenty that are give you tidbits, you know, like... like um, you know they have the same thing, but it, it's not it's not the whole enchilada, if it were. Oh, that made me chuckle. <laughs> I'm looking at the pictures. I'm looking at the style, particularly you know flying around this little airship and uh, everything. So you mentioned Diablo. This is more not, not so much ISO 3D. It's third person view, a little bit more World of Warcraft D camera, the graphics a little bit more in that style. Is that correct? Yeah, the um, yeah, it's third person, um, possibly going between third and first person. Uh, we'll see by the end, but right now, third person. Um, it's going to be stylized. Um, that just helps in a lot of aspects. As far as I don't, I don't particularly like the super realistic uh, games that that try to be like completely realistic because i never get a feel like it's that and then your computer is always dredging dredging so one of the main important things for me as far as gameplay is concerned is that it's fluid that you know you have to be able to connect with the character connect with the controls to be able to you know you know implement your skill into the game so if that's not there then uh doesn't matter how pretty it looks it's got to be um you, you know you you have a disconnect well in some of the images i've seen Uh, as far as shifting between first and third person, I think the only ones that I remember looking at that were first person were when the character was using like a bow. And I mean, shooting can work well either first or third person, but melee, a lot of the melee stuff works definitely better in third person anyway. Yeah, uh, most everything does. And the only reason I was kind of toying with which one would be better and and going around, I think third person just works better altogether. The first person will be later on when we do the VR version of this game. So I wanted to touch on that. Drac, you already mentioned melee and bows. The game's called Wild Mage. It's magic, right? We're supposed to be some kind of mageling that runs around throwing fireballs. 
But you also mentioned in the material you sent us, and in the stuff we looked at, there's a warrior, there's a thief. And, you know, I'm used to wizards and mages being the really weak, wasteland like characters. What are we doing with swords and bows? Ah, I'm glad you asked. So... Magic, I think, has never really been uh, been shown in its full potential as far as games. Like I've played, uh, like I love mages, but you know, I play a lot, and it's just sparkles, and like they're, it's just unrealistic. Like they can't do anything, and like you could be a warrior and clear out a whole dungeon while the the mage just casts one spell and he's got to sit down for like an hour, you know. So. What I wanted to do, wild mages, I don't know if you guys know the lore behind them, um, from D&D is you know, they deal in primal magic, right? So, and just like Gandalf, they, you know, there are mages that have swords and staffs. So I wanted a, um, for me and my place, I want a kind of a seamless integration between sword and spell. So because all of them are mages, right? So everyone's a mage, but... It's how they um, how they use their magic. So, do I use my magic to buffer my my combat abilities? Do I use my magic for my bow and arrow? Do I use my magic for um, you know for meteors? Uh, do I use it for stealth? So, you kind of craft your character in that sense. And the the classes are still in flux. Like they're they're not going to be like that um, by the release of the game. Um, they'll be a lot more intuitive because you're going to get your stats, get your skills from the spells that you acquire. Um, so you have the ability to kind of craft your character as you see fit. Because I, I usually cross class a lot, so but I still believe that everyone should have a role in a group. So there's still some leaning on the whole the archetypical class structures, mage, warrior, cleric, thief. Yeah, I love I love doing dungeons and I love doing dungeons with friends and family and you you know uh, I miss the trinity cuz a lot of MMOs have done away with that um or you know there are no dungeons anymore or for whatever reason. But it's nice that everyone has a role like enchanter. Like I used to play EverQuest 1, you know, way back in the day. You have enchanter, you have a mage, you have a warrior. So in this sense, everyone, you know, they use magic, but they all use magic differently. They all have a role to play. And, you know, you work together to achieve a goal. Yeah, I'm, I'll am admit, I'm in the opposite end of that spectrum. I'm for uh, class-less systems. I like the notion of here's everything. You know, here's a big bucket of everything. Pick out what you want and need. And then hopefully the team ends up with somebody who can tank and somebody who can heal and somebody might be a bit of a class cannon, but you might not. <laughs> And there's, sorry, I'm, I'm going a little bit off track. I know, Rachel's going to hurt me. I like that idea of doing it wrong. I play every single RPGs that I played, I've intentionally played wrong. I mean, I'll be a healer in Warframe as a glass cannon, just, just for the hell of it, just because I can. I'm exactly the same way. We used to, that's how we played every MMO, and that's kind of how this was born. Uh, we played, we are beta testing for... Uh, uh, for Vanguard Saga of Heroes, right? And, you know, the fun of the game is to go and do things you're not supposed to do with the amount of people you're not supposed to do them at. But in this format, you have you have all the tools. Like, y- there's no restrictions on what you can do. You know, I still want the classes to be able to be there, but you can still make your guys you see fit. You know, that's a big deal. You're not you're not you're not going to be stuck into a can of this is all you can have. I mean, um, you'll still be able to have to create a. Uh, how can I put it? You'll it still wants you to be able to create a healer, to create a tank, to create a thief, right? But you can do it however you want. Can I make a warrior person who heals people by hitting them with his sword? Oh, absolutely. Goody. Then I'm happy. Yeah, li- life steal. No, that's the thing. Like, there's, there's the the skills and spells you'll get from the monsters. You can purpose into whatever you want. So, maybe I'm throwing people off by by showing the classes, which I I regret it after I put it up there. Um, but don't don't take that to heart. You're gonna be able to. You'll have a bunch of abilities. If you want an ability, you have to go get it from whatever monster, whatever there. But then you can put it into whatever playstyle you have. You know. 
I, what I wanted was that you still have the ability to have that Trinity set up or become a, um, an enchanter or become, you know, a solid mage or, or whatever, you know, be specialized. Match your style. That's what matters, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Because I have a weird playing style, you have a weird playing style. We all have our... But by now, after playing for so long, everyone has their own like unique way they want to play, and that's what they'll always purpose everything towards. But I want to give them the ability to be able to do that, you know? I'm annoyed because I'm trying to remember a game on the PlayStation 4 where I could literally make a machine gun that healed people when you shot them. Well, and, and on that note, then, of being able to customize some of these spells for your play style, some of the videos I saw, uh, like test footage, shows your characters, like, slicing and dicing some of these uh, trolls into, like, these ham hock like chunks. And so was that a special weapon that you had picked up, or is that a spell effect on the weapon that's allowing you to slice through them like that? Um, it'll be many things. What I'm showing is you'll have spells that can cut through monsters. You'll have spells that can disintegrate terrain. All the all the islands are foxhole, so but you have to have the spell in order to damage. Like if you don't have, uh, if you're not hitting it with a meteor, if you're only hitting it with some other spell, the spell has to be able to damage the terrain. But it can damage the terrain. Oh, oops, sorry, I was pressing the wrong button. Um, yeah, no, you. There's many spells that can do that, and there there are spells that can do it from range. There are spells you can put on. So that sword is a vorpal sword. I don't know if you guys are are familiar with the type, but oh, yeah. anything vorpal will just cut through stuff. Um, so you can have vorpal blades. You can have um, you can have spells that'll chop up monsters. You have spells that you know that freeze them, and then you know they turn into just shatter. Um, and then all the all the terrain is voxel, like the the islands, they're all voxel, but you have to have the spell powerful enough to control it. So there's some dungeons where, you know, it's locked with this giant, big, solid rock face, but if you don't have a spell powerful enough to destroy that rock face to get into the dungeon, you're not getting into the dungeon. That was something that looked really cool, too, is that there was a lot of environments that appeared to be destructible. I'm trying to make everything that I can possibly make destructible, but but understand that you'll need the power to destroy it, right? Not everyone's going to run through and be cutting stuff. When you see someone cutting through something like I was doing, then they have some pretty badass stuff. You're just going to hit and it's going to fall over, or you know, when you first start off, um, you have to have the power in order to do that kind of stuff. Because I want it to, you know, if someone's doing that, I'd be like, wow, that's awesome. Well, and some of the creatures appear to be able to destroy the environment as well. So if you're in, say, some kind of underground cave or, or whatnot, and they start blasting down columns, um, if those columns fall, and do you take damage from the environment that, that falls down? Oh, you certainly do. <laughs> All right, that's cool. That adds a, a level of challenge to, to fighting something like that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's going to be... My AI is, is terrifying, to be honest. I, I die all the time. But uh, with a group, I, my level of success should rise. But there'll be spells, like you have barriers which create like a bubble around you. So when stuff like that falls on, someone can cast a barrier and it'll it'll fall off. The barrier will take the damage instead of you. Um, yeah, it's going to... There's going to be a... I'm trying to reimagine the genre really where, you know, you're stuck in the same cycles. Um, every game I play is a lot similar to the other games and I'm trying to break out of that. Um, you're going to have monsters that you don't see all the time or maybe have never seen before. Um, they're going to be doing things that, you know, you've never seen before. Well now, okay, so the barrier will block that. Are, do do other spells interact with the environment like that? For instance, if you were to cast a lightning bolt into a puddle of water or a fireball across a, a puddle of oil, will it set the oil on fire? Oh, yeah. If you see it, um, I have some videos. If you throw a fireball in a dry field, what happens? Like, the whole field catches on fire. And then, yeah. And you can use those for your advantage. Um, the thing is, is that when you're down in dungeons and the miasma, like, say, some miasma seeps in through a hole, maybe you made that hole. Who knows? We're not blaming people right now. But <laughs> um, you've got to think differently than you would normally think. Because, yeah, you can kill... 
you know, these 50 monsters, but they're going to keep coming. So you have to find another way to stop it. So you've got to block the hole. Maybe you, you summon a statue or maybe you blast down a call and that'll, that'll keep them from coming through. Um, but you've got to think differently than just, I'm killing this guy, I'm killing that guy, because they're not going to stop coming. Okay, well, you mentioned some of the different creatures. Then what, what kinds of enemies or creatures can we expect to see in this world? Um, as many as I can get in. Um, let's see, you're going to have... Uh, oh, I don't have my list of guys here. I mean... Um, trolls, ants, centaurs, um, beholders, liches. Um, I gotta stop you right shadow, there. Shadow dancers. Beholders? Can I have one as a pet? Can I play as one? <laughs> if you're a fairy, you could probably charm one. Ooh. If you play as a fairy, isn't that default for you, drunk? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll take the hit anyway if I can charm a beholder and have it follow me around like a pet. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but as soon as you said beholders, uh, those are one of my favorite creatures in D&D. So I, I, was like, I need to know more. I need to see more. <laughs> yeah, they're going to be pretty nasty. Um, but some of the lower level ones, if you have the, the high enough spell, yeah, you'll be able to do it. Or the stats anyway. Well, that's cool. So then, uh, sorry, after that, you'd mentioned liches, and, and I think you were going with them more. I've seen dragons as well. Can you talk a little bit about how the dragons work in the world? So the dragons will be kind of everywhere. There's different versions. The one you're seeing is a small drake. Um, I've got different kinds. We have, like, the Chinese kind, you know, that float around. We have... Um, I wanted a few different... You have skeletal dragons. You have... You know, all the different versions, like, you'll have... Because, uh, so, the altitude affects the environment of the island, so the higher ones will be snowy, the lower ones will be, like, desert-ish. So you'll have your normal variety, I would say your D&D variety, in there, um, with all their set abilities. A small, um, this is just a pet peeve of mine. When you have dragons, are they tetrapods? Some places have dragons where they have hind legs and then they have wings with hands on and others have hind legs, front legs and wings. The former is a tetrapod, the latter is weird. So does it have separate front legs, front arms, or is that integrated into the wings? Well, I mean, there's wyverns and stuff, but not like dragons usually have four legs, don't they? Yeah, that's precisely... People like to differentiate with the dragons and wyverns. It's just the biologist in me. I it always annoys me seeing you know the wings being separate. I I like the ones. It's also just stylistically. I really like when people make proper dragons, not wyverns, because they tend to be smaller. Where the arms and everything's integrated into the wings. It just it makes the animations cooler. I don't. I think so at least. That's me. Yeah. No. I feel you on that. Yeah. We'll we'll try and do a good job. Um. Yeah, Rick's uh, my the concept artist. He's he's really big on that. I mean, we played D and D for many years. So, well, and, and anybody who comes from a D and D background, that'll be one of the biggest distinctions between what constitutes a dragon or a wyvern, because exactly a wyvern doesn't have front legs, but a dragon does. Well, at least in D and I mean, there's there's many adaptations, but I've you know I've I've got my preferences. So, okay, other sl- small pet peeves. The magical system, you've talked a little bit about getting spells, etc. And we see the little classical blue bulb of mana. So are we looking at a point mana-based system? Or is there also a skill slot-based system? How, how do you foresee this playing? Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. The The UI that you guys are seeing is just, it was, uh, it's just a test. The UI is not going to look anything like that. Um, actually, you're not really going to run out of mana. Uh, mana and health are kind of incorporated together. Um, and the system's a little hard to talk about right now. Um, but basically, you can, if you, you use all your mana when you hit zero, you'll pretty much die. <laughs> okay. So go back and sleep. <laughs> no um it's hard to explain but they'll 
you're gonna one thing i i don't like about mages is that they you know once their mana's out then they have to sit or they have to drink a potion or stuff so you're going to be able to cast a, a lot of spells um depending on your liking but the, the system i have um i'll need a little more time to explain okay well we i guess for that one we should look for an update or something over on the kickstarter yeah, um, I'll, I'll try and do, yeah, if in the newsletter or an update. I, I haven't got to that point, but it's not going to be your traditional health and mana kind of setup. So I'm going to try and re I'm trying to reinvent it to a system that makes sense because I want you to be able to cast, you know, a lot of magic, like without having to worry about, oh, I'm out of mana, oh, I'm out of mana, because that's going to happen a lot, especially with the amount of monsters I'm throwing at you. So um, I'm trying to develop a system where you. You you're pretty much going to be able to because um, you deal in primal magic, so you're going to be able to rip mana from around you, but you're going to have to be able to recharge. So for like three seconds, you're going to be charging and pulling mana from all over you. It's going to fill up your thing, and then you'll be back to throwing spells down. So you won't. So you could cast a barrier over yourself, recharge real quick, and then go back at it or something along those lines. Sounds a bit like it's a more of a cooldown system and possibly a skill-based, i.e. if you have the skill, you can use it. You might fail the skill, but then when you use it, there's a cooldown. In a way, um, I want to keep it kind of as fast-paced as possible, but still have as much strategy involved as you can. Because remember, you're on a you're on like a one to two hour time frame for whatever it is you're doing, so you can't sit around and wait for everyone to regain their mana, especially at higher levels that. You're like, you're sitting there, you're, I mean, you'll have potions and, and what have you, just like normal, but um, have a way where it's it's a little faster paced, but you can still implement, like, um, you know, there's still some tactic to it. Well, it's something interesting I've seen implemented in some of the fantasy novels that I've read, but not necessarily in many, if any, of the uh, tabletop games that I've played before is that if you draw from the, the uh, mana or the magic around you and, and you've basically exhausted that resource, that it then folds in and you can draw from your own life force to power those spells. So I don't know if that's something you were considering or, or something you might are even interested in looking at, but maybe if you run out of mana, you can start to eat at your own health to cast some of those spells. Yeah, like an entropy system. That's what I was talking about. Your health and mana are entwined, you know. So when I'm at, if I'm quote unquote out of mana, and I use I use this term lightly, is that you can pull. So let's say one health point is equal to a hundred mana or something. So you start pulling from your life force, and then someone else could heal you in some that way, so you can keep going. But there's going to be there has to be a, a balancing structure, and to make it at least tactical and interesting. But I don't want people sitting around forever you know or they're just completely out and you just get washed Ooh, you're making me think of something because i was reading and i'm diverging a little bit sorry there's all these floating cities islands as you already mentioned and that at their core there's a gemstone with magic so magic is what holds these up could you end up messing up this floating island by drawing too much mana from it <laughs> oh, it's it's not you that's going to be messing it up. So, so the story behind the whole world is there's people don't know a whole lot of the history of of how they got to where they are. Right now, they're just kind of living on these islands, right? Um, they you know they have trade routes, they have houses, they have farms. Um, so, but once upon a time, there was um, there was like a reverend. He used himself to power a portal to oblivion. And that portal got stuck open, and that's where all this miasma came from. Um, and so there was no way to fight off all the monsters that this stuff keeps spawning. Um, so at the time, the uh, the high council started just you know throwing these these islands up in the air, and that's where they are now. But the magic powering the islands is starting to fade. So they're slowly sinking back down into the miasma and that's where you are right now where it's becoming like a huge problem that all the islands are sinking down so what the miasma wants to do is pull the islands down to the ground back down to the ground because basically to it your food you know they feeds off the magical energy so all the all the monsters are trying to destroy these float stones um, that you're trying to protect so 
in order to protect the floatstones, they created these dungeons, and that's why every island has a dungeon, is to protect the heart of the island where the floatstones are. And they have traps, and they have puzzles to keep the stuff, the, the miasma-spawned monsters from destroying the island and bringing it back down to the ground. Okay, so you can't mess up and accidentally sink one of these islands into the miasma. Yeah, if you destroy the float zones in the in the heart of the island, you'll drop it. But could you drain them on purpose and say, "I there's enemies, I need to defeat them, drain this, take a chance, you know, possibly mess up and kill a hundred people." Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, you can drain it, and people actually go around and harvest float stones to keep other islands, uh, you know, adrift or for the main city or whatever. It's actually like a, a big business. Um, so a lot of times, where their problems are is when they've drained too much magic out of the the heart of the island, and it floats down lower into the miasma, spawns more monsters, and goes. And they go and kill everybody. Well, but if you drain that thing, how do you get out of there before it drops? <laughs> <laughs> yeah good luck <laughs> they, they they drop slowly that's not going to be like a hard a hard drop like they'll start losing altitude and i'll try and um and somewhere there'll be like an altitude meter of of how the condition of the island is doing that kind of thing so so you've mentioned that this is an open world type game are you going to be going to people and getting quests through conversations or message boards? Is there going to be a quest system or is this, you just go out and explore and check out the different islands? Um, there'll be some quests. I, I hate, uh, I don't like a lot of quests or a lot of quest systems. Like I want, so first of all, I want them to be more exploration, more adventure. You're going out you're finding out about the world you know you go into like an abandoned whatever and you read books about what happened there or uh, figure out more about like the the old world before all this happened um but i want you to um, one thing i want is i want you to go out and like things find you you know you end up in situations or or this Uh, maybe someone will point you in that direction but i want to try and keep away from from the static like oh go kill 10 this or bring me back a bucket of whatever ah the annoying fetch quests yeah, I mean, I, I just I zone out every time I see any of those in any game. It's it's just terrible. Come on, they're a stable of all RPGs. They need to be in there. <laughs> I'm not I'm not entirely sure about that. I'm, if if I don't need them in there, I won't have them in there. But there'll there'll be quests. Um, I mean, there'll be some quests to give you to guide you to places, uh, and then things will happen once you reach those places. Um, like in dungeons or, you know, uh, on on land or something. You know, maybe you you go to a farm and you know, like the corn, you know, came alive and they summoned their corn-based god and they killed everyone there and you have to go and stop them or something. I guess you would also have to do just you know for all the classics the escort mission where you're escorting something that's. Faster than your walking speed, but slower than your running speed. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Those might be more annoying than the fetch quests. <laughs> oh, man. Escort missions. Ugh. Everybody loves escort missions. Yeah, I mean, I, I've played enough that I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, uh, do the best job I can with what we have to make it uh, not as annoying. I just kind of want to try and rethink everything, you know, look at it at a different way, because uh, everything's been done a bunch of times, and, you know, the one thing I don't want is you to come in and know exactly what's going to go on or how everything's going to operate, you know. A lot of the, the the most memorable games I've played is where you have to, you go in there and you learn different systems and different ways things are, and you have to teach everybody else the, how things work, you know. Yeah. It's always... um one of those things actually the whole learning how a game works it's just some games do it right some games do it wrong there's no middle ground on that run that's no there there's no middle ground <laughs> so, yeah i can only say i hope you do it right um me too me too i'm i'm hoping i'll, I'll do my best <sighs> so can we safely say in this game you basically play even though wild mage in a lot of settings these are 
well, neutral or unlawful neutral, and rarely good. But at some point, you are a good person in this because you have an interest in having the island still stay afloat. I mean, wild mages are aren't really looked at. So in in this universe, wild mages are are simply created by locking someone in a room with miasma and them surviving. Uh, so if they survive, they're technically a wild mage. So they're not good or evil or anything. They're they're more of like a menace, you know, a, a walking catastrophe, if you will. Bit worried about who takes people locking them in a room with the miasma that's trying to kill everything. Well, that was their only their only way to have anyone powerful enough to fight off the monsters. So, so the High Council, this was like their only strategy because when stuff gets infested or anything, there's no one really powerful enough to go in there and stop them. So they're like their elite force of people that would go in and clean up messes or rescue adventurers that get trapped or deal with you know bigger problems. Um, so this is more of a an ends to a mean. So are these people who volunteered to do this, or are they maybe a criminal element that were taken from the jail cells and tossed in there? Or how is it that someone gets picked to get tossed in there to see if they can become a, a wild mage? Are they being voluntold? <laughs> well, in the beginning, it was it was like an honor. Uh, people trained, you know, they were they it was you know the the top tier um yeah everyone fortified but the ratio of of people that would survive was very low so they'd all be sent if they died they were sent to this place um the catacombs and i think you've seen some video of it uh so that's where all the people that didn't make it they either go crazy or they become monsters or or what have you but they all get thrown down there um and then later on they just they'll you know anyone that was willing to to go they'll take and you know in exchange they'll get uh, like money or items or you know some kind of life well now you mentioned the catacombs and yeah that was one of the areas i saw that looks really great that the set design for multiple different places that that i've seen thus far looks really beautiful like especially the forests so I, i'm curious what were some of your inspirations when designing that um, I mean, they're just, uh, it's hard, like, I'm an artist, so they're just places that, like, I, I, I try and, when I'm creating the world or creating areas, it's, it's, if I'm here, why am I here, how do I, it's more like, how do I feel when I'm here, you know, um, do I, do I feel like I'm in a catacombs where all these people were thrown in, or I feel like I'm in an enchanted forest? You know, the, the feeling and then the music and stuff, they're all very important um, aspects. And that's basically kind of all I go off of. Okay, you mentioned music again, and I have to ask about one of the videos I saw on your YouTube channel. The thriller video that you put together, that was hilarious. Is that something you were doing just as kind of a, a fun break from game design, or, or how did that come together? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, you got to keep your sense of humor. I don't think anyone can can take themselves too seriously. So, you know, try and throw in a throw in a breather once in a while. How long did it take you to put that together? I'm just curious. Uh, Not too long, like a day or two. Yeah, that that was hilarious with them coming out of the woods like that and dancing, though. Yeah, I wanted it to seem spooky at first, and like, oh, what's going on? And then just be like, do, 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 do. It, it was really my wife's idea, so I can't take all the credit. <laughs> Ooh, do we get a dance spell? Can we make the enemies dance? Do you guys remember Otto's Irresistible Dance? Yep. I'm not entirely sure of who Otto was, but he had weird spells. He had some really fucked up spells. Uh, sorry, messed up spells. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much. I think there's so much content out there that that hasn't really been brought into games that that I I would love to see, and that's why I wanted to do a magic based game because there's a lot of great stuff you can do with magic that that no one really touches on. So, and it's not all about like killing and meteors and stuff. It's like how can you know make them ridiculous and then kill them, you know. Well, one of the clips, and I was seeing this, I'm assuming it's a gnome, somebody who's small enough that you can only really see the hat. 
and then a bunch of skeletons just being dragged through the air. I'm like, hmm, that looks fun. Yeah, um, it is a gnome. Uh, and so I, right now for classes or for races, um, we've got the human, elf, gnome, fairy, dwarf. Um, I'm trying, I might have more later, um, but I'm trying to get in. I wanted to get in races that you don't have in every game or that you've never been able to play before. So I really want to have those by release, but we'll see how it goes. But if anything, do them in a way that hasn't been done before. So in that particular scene, um, that's just a tornado spell. So you can do that wherever you want really and how powerful it is depends on how powerful your your spell is but there are also monsters that are um or bosses that are uh that are the tornado so like let's say um because they're you know like the red tide they're like a super organism so if i kill a peon like all these trash mobs right i'm just they're just going the the power is going back to the boss making it more powerful so they'll either just literally fly up and attach to it and become this giant monstrosity that's attacking you um so you got to kind of balance out i uh how you kill either the trash or you need to control them somehow because killing's not always the answer sometimes you have to control them or block them off or to keep the boss less powerful um I'd keep strategy in there. Just a notion. We're on islands that are floating above a deadly miasma. Well, fog. Air-based spells that causes things to fly around. That does not seem safe. Not even a little bit. Nothing in this game is safe. So... <laughs> oh yeah, but they're safe, and then they're seriously not safe. You're going to have... Um, there'll be a lot of spells that, you know, like Bubble, um, Flash Step, uh, that fly, so you can recover if you fall off an island or something. You'll be you'll have something that should be able to, you know, like a ethereal uh, uh, hook, like a grappling hook, or, you know, depending on what you have, there'll be something there to keep you safe. But yeah, I mean, you're on an island, so something's going to fall off. Okay. Flying squirrel wings so you can glide down to the next island. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, levitate, um, the glide, you know, wings, the spawn wings, um, call your mount, you know, there, there'll be a bunch of stuff to keep you from, you know, intimate death. Track, that could actually be a cool little dungeon thing that, you know, the dungeon ends up at the bottom of one island and then you have to float down to the next one. Yeah, there'll be there'll be a few like that. Um, there's also mount-based uh, dungeons where you know, so your dragon, if you have a dragon mount, it can obviously breathe fire. Or like, say you're riding a rhino, you know, you can charge stuff. Um, a lot of games don't really do mount attacks. I'm not sure why, but I think it'd be fun to ha go in and to have. Uh, a dungeon geared towards mounts where you're riding or flying or whatever and you know you can stay on them and do what you need to do of course you can get off but you can also get on and then also airship uh airship based dungeons where you're going around flying around with your airship shooting other airships or dragons or what have you aerial combat oh no so far it really sounds like it could be a heck of a lot of fun it has all those little you no know, as far as I can tell, all the RPG tropes in it has the archetypical classes and races. You are expanding on those, of course. It has the co-op options. Hey, I'm always for co-op. Third-person view, a lot of hang and slash, not necessarily too much thinking, if I'm getting it right, except for the traps and puzzles. We'll let somebody else deal with those, just as long as I can get hack and slash. I'm enjoying what I'm hearing so far. I'm really getting into this. I appreciate that. It's going to be a lot of the, I mean, there, there's a lot of elements that are the same, um, but we're just trying to, like I said, reimagine the whole thing and still make it fun, uh, fast paced, you know, action based, uh, where you can get in, get out and do something, but still feel like, um, still feel like you're living in the world. You know, you're not just going into dungeons all the time. You can, you know, fly around in airships, have those, or have your mounts, or still be able to harvest and craft. Oh, um, another thing on crafting. So when you make an item, like you don't make, you don't make those terrible items. You make like one item, which is like a relic or something. But in order to wield the item, you have to pass the items. Um, challenge if it were in order to wield it 
So you, it's basically like a dungeon uh, that the item spawns once you touch it that you have to pass in order to even be able to wield it. So a mini quest. Yeah, like a little mini thing. Well, you had mentioned, or at least you touched a little bit on the different races, and one of the questions that that brought to mind for me is people love to customize their characters. So during character creation, is there a lot of uh, customization as far as how your character looks? And then as you continue to adventure and level, does the gear change your appearance? And, and is there customization options for the gear? Yeah, um, customization is uh, it's huge. Um, right now with the scope that we have... Um, uh, it, it will be in our stretch goals because uh, I want to, you know, do it well. But all that should be there if, if we reach the goal. If not, it'll take a little longer for it to be implemented, but eventually it'll be in. But at the moment, um, yeah, it, it'll be more time because I want to do it right, you know. Um, it's very important for everyone to customize this stuff. Gear is also huge, so to make sure that the gear is good, because we're, we're dealing everything that you have in here, um, because it's not level, it's not technically level one. Like everything you'll get is either like legendary or ancient or or something substantial. So every piece of um, every item you have is meaningful. Like you're not gonna have like a lot of trash stuff. Well, okay, I'm starting to look at the time here and. Gee, I know, I'm sure he'll elbow me and kick me because I could probably keep going on about this for at, at least another hour or two because there's just so many things I want to know and see. <laughs> I love what I'm seeing. I, I'm excited. I can't wait to play this some more. But um, you guys, uh, I'm seeing that it's, it is releasing on, on Windows and you're looking to release to other platforms at some point or no? Um, yes, that, the other platforms will also be in our stretch goals, and we uh, right now we're, our scope is releasing on Steam, so that'll be, if our goal is met, that's what we'll be releasing on, but um, uh, we'll have the other platforms in the stretch goals. And have you targeted any potential platforms specifically, or just, um, you know, like the big ones, or, you know, you're not even worried about it unless you maybe hit the stretch goal? Well, no, we, I mean, we really want to get them on other platforms, but, you know, it's, it's time and money. So right now we're looking at, of course, Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch. You hear that, Bam? It seems like it could be good on Switch. <laughs> no, I, I mean that serious track. The notion of a game that you can jump in and out of relatively easily, you know, an hour's commitment, that seems to me to work well on Switch, just as long as you can figure out getting the Switch online. Well, yeah, the, that's the one thing we're waiting on. They're actually coming out with Switch Online. I don't know if it's public or not, but um, for the developers, we've got the we've got the builder packs for it. So I don't know when they're going to announce the official online uh, setup, but it'll be coming soon, at least uh, in a year or so. Goody, but you're right. It is coming up on the hour, and you mentioned the platforms. They'll be there via the stretch goals. I like that word, actually. We have more goals. <laughs> we should probably mention, anybody sitting out there thinking, is this going to be an expensive game? Right now, at time of recording, the minimum price seems to be about 25 US dollars to get the game. So that seems quite, you know, a good price. It doesn't seem expensive. We don't have to use all our bacon tokens on it, as Bam would say. Yeah, uh, we want to keep it reasonable, so it'd be twenty twenty five dollars. I think is it should be um, just fine. Yeah, no, it, it seems quite fair. I've seen less for more. If if you hit what you say you're going to hit, then yeah, we've definitely seen less for more. Yeah, I paid I paid eighty dollars for. Uh, let's see, the last game I was playing was Revelation Online. But then I had to pay, I had to buy a scroll if I wanted to do a dungeon more than once a day. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess I guess we should ask then, do you have plans for future paid content for the game once it releases? Or is that not necessarily on the roadmap at this point? Um, yeah, right now we're just focused on release. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what our, our plan will be afterwards. Uh, we're hoping to continually release content. Um, so how we're going to go about doing that will kind of depend on, we'll have a better idea by the time we, we get closer to release. So we'll, we'll update that in newsletters. Well, and I like the idea that you mentioned, you know, you especially considering the fact that you're targeting, you know, a couple hours of playtime per sitting. 
but that you know it may start out a little small, but you're still planning to add to it uh, as time goes on. Now that the Kickstarter has gone live and you've got my bacon tokens, I can't wait for the game to come out so I can play it. You know, and we are, we appreciate your support. Ah, uh, I have a note here saying also, Drac, remember the newsletter. Sign up for the newsletter. And it goes for everybody else. Sign up. At least follow what's going on. Yeah, um, yeah. if you're interested in learning more, uh, I know we haven't covered everything here, but we will try and give um, at least a once a month updates. Um, and uh, on Twitter and Facebook, we, we update regularly. Um, sometimes I do one or two updates a day. I want to be as transparent as possible when making the game um, and show, you guys, show everyone what we're working on and, and what it looks like. Because um, I hate when games kind of go dark for years and then they show up and there's kind of a big gap between what the players want and what the developers created. Um, so I'm trying to get as much feedback as we can and implement what makes sense into the game. So if, if something just doesn't seem right or like, oh, that's weird, then we can make the change before release. Good man. Good man. Well, in that respect, have you guys already set up a Discord channel for the game? Um, yeah, I just uh, set one up. In fact, it's Wild Mage. Um, I can send a link or give you a link to post um, if you guys would like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that I've seen another developer, well, I should say some other developers have been doing, but one one specifically, I don't know if you've heard of the game, Wolson, but they've got both their Discord channel set up and then they're also using a site to publish their development roadmap to keep people abreast of the changes and in development, you know, timelines and, and the different things that they're working on. And that's kind of a, been really a neat thing to watch and see what they're working on at any given time. Yeah. And like I said, yeah, we really love the feedback. And, you know, even if it, if they're like, oh, you know, this doesn't make sense or what, that's, it's really helpful um, getting feedback from the community and, and just keeping, you know, keeping the conversation going as we all, it's more of a journey because everyone, we want everyone to have fun playing the game. So, uh, getting everyone's aspect because sometimes you you know you don't see the whole side, so it's nice to have uh, other angles that that people are looking at. Damn it, Drag! I just said we're coming up on the hour. That's your cue to start winding it down, to start asking more questions, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> he said there's beholders in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I know what will stop you, Drag. Isn't this your contractually obligated question per BAM? <laughs> no, because this, this will stop you from asking any other question. You get to ask it. Go ahead. All right. Well, something we ask every guest that comes on the show, it's a continuous theme, is uh, what kind of bacon do you like? How do you like said bacon prepared? And what type of alcoholic beverage, beer, cider, etc., would you pair with that bacon? Well, I'd go crispy bacon, and I'd go with old-fashioned uh, one ice cube, please. Well, and I have to ask, since you're here in Southern California where I'm at, have you ever been to uh, Slater's 50-50? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, man. Their peanut butter and jelly bacon burger is phenomenal. Oh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I love burgers. I love the combination of peanut butter and bacon, especially if it's maple bacon, so... They've got a maple bacon milkshake that's pretty divine as well. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had the milkshake yet. I'll, I'll have to try it out. It's maple bacon flavored, but it also has pieces of bacon in the milkshake, which is a little bit strange of an experience if you're not expecting it because there's chunks that you chew in your milkshake, but it tastes wonderful. <laughs> uh, sounds awesome. I'm slightly disgusted at this point, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't knock it till you've tried it catch up on your spaghetti man <laughs> it's good that's good well crispy bacon now i want some damn it that happens every time doesn't it yeah i think usually about this time in a podcast we start getting everybody hungry yeah that's literally a complaint i've had anyways it is time to wrap up lucas it was awesome having you on you've um, gotten us even more excited about the game than we were about a week ago as Drax said, you already has his bacon token, so only thing really left to say is to everybody else, go and have a look at this Kickstarter. It is an interesting little game and doesn't necessarily have to stay little. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, guys. All I can say is, gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> I can't wait to get my hands on more of this. <laughs> it's 
But yeah, thank you so much for coming on, man. I'm I'm looking forward to to this being successful on the Kickstarter and getting a chance to see more of the game. Well, all right, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us for another interview. This has been the Bamsters crew talking with Lucas, uh, one of the developers from Wild Mage. Definitely go check out the Kickstarter. Check out some of the videos and, and material for it. And please support them because this game looks like it's going to be awesome. So until next time, if you like what you've heard, please like and subscribe. If you don't like what you heard, share it with somebody you don't like.